Hello, this is Good Morning Transfers. Uh, breaking transfer news reaching us from Tottenham. We'll bring you that very shortly. But has Christian Eriksen played his last game for the club? We've got the latest on his future. There are plenty of ways, remember, for you guys to get involved. Chelsea say no to Nathan Ake for £40 million. We analyse what that means for both Chelsea and Bournemouth's January plans. Aston Villa have two new players, but they're yet to sign a striker. We'll be assessing their transfer activity. The winter break is nearly all over in Scotland. Celtic have added to their squad, but all clubs are still looking to do business. We've got you covered in the Scottish Premier. And Arsenal fans, listen closely. Alexander Lacazette is the latest player to be shortlisted by another major European club. We bring you the latest. And we do start with that breaking news from Tottenham, the one that Tottenham fans have been waiting for. There is a welcome video on Tottenham Hotspur's Twitter. It is that Jensen Fernandes has joined the club. It is an 18-month loan deal from Benfica. The deal does come with an option to buy for 50 million euros. That's about 42.7 million pounds. His squad number will be number 30. Uh, and Anton, we did know that this one was going to be confirmed. We were waiting for it to happen, but it wasn't necessarily the most straightforward one. <laughs> for Tottenham. It wasn't. It's been other clubs in London have been teased, they've been flirted with, can they, can they not sign in West Ham with the first club to swipe right effectively coming for him. <laughs> you saw it on Instagram. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he, he showed an interest as well. So West Ham made the initial contact. They spoke to him, uh, made an offering to Benfica. His agent's been in the UK for a couple of weeks trying to organise a deal after the player fell out with uh, the Benfica coach. Um, Chelsea then came in when West Ham thought they were close, offered a deal which was uh, an, uh, an obligation to buy the player if he played more than 50% of games in an 18-month loan spell. Uh, then West Ham revised their offer and made it a pure loan offer. And then eventually Tottenham came in at the last moment and pipped them into the post with their deal, as you said, Joe, which is an option to buy at the end of the loan spell for around, what, £42 million? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. £42.7 million. So it's an interesting one. He's a young player, a long, deep-lying playmaker that doesn't mind a tackle, can kind of do a bit of everything. I'm really fascinated to see what Jose Mourinho can do with a player like this. He's got all the tools, but he's only started 13 league games in the last 18 months. That's not a huge sample size to go off. So it's, it's exciting for Tottenham fans. It's exciting for Jose Mourinho. But again, it's, you've got to question why a player who's a full international at 21 has been made available. And so yeah. easily as well. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, you mentioned how exciting a player he potentially could be. But Michael, he's going to have to hit the ground running because that's kind of part of the reason that they targeted him. Yeah, that they targeted him pretty much soon after the injury to Mr Sissoko, which could be for the season. Mr Sissoko, for Mauricio Pochettino and Jose Mourinho, has been very versatile. He can play in the midfield too. He's probably better as a wider right with his pace. Um, but you look at Fernandes, he's very, very versatile. Why did they go for Fernandes? Because Eriksen is probably on his way out. Eric Dyer, he's still probably struggling with match fitness. I've mentioned Mr Sissoko. Someone told me, it was a good source at West Ham as well, told me, as soon as clubs were involved, other clubs were involved, they weren't as hopeful. So when you heard David Moyes... Um, in his press conference when he sort of played it down a little bit. There was a lot of truth in that because clubs had come in for him. He's clearly a very good player as well. And for Tottenham, they need bodies. They're still in the FA Cup. The Champions League resumes soon and they really need to get in that top four. I think it's an interesting move by Spurs. It's kind of a good good sign of their sort of activeness within the transfer market, first of all, to kind of stamp their defiance to turn around and say, this is the player that we shortlisted, this is the player we're going to go after. No matter what our rivals are saying, if we need a player in that position, we're not going to allow him to go to a rival. But it's that adaptability that you talk about. I've, I've, obviously, with the interest, we've had to watch more and more of him, and he does have that direct running. He does always want to play forward. I don't want to like make comparisons, especially young players coming into the league, but he does kind of fit that similar mould of a Ramirez. When Ramirez first came, that yeah. had that still in the midfield, but still had the adaptability to play wide right, can get you goals, always wants to think forward. And I like that mould of player. And Mourinho likes yeah. that mould of player as yeah. well, where he's yeah. he's more than one faceted in terms of the way that he can turn around and distribute his attributes. I think that's a really good comparison. He's, yeah. His yeah. shooting from distance is better than, than right. Ramirez. You're right, he does like to drift wide, which I think Mourinho will probably coach out of him a little bit, try and make him more effective in the middle. 
He never goes in the box either. Shoots from distance. So it's going to be interesting to see whether that fits the, fits the mould as well. But Mourinho will be delighted. He's got a player he can just mould into it, into what he wants for 18 months. And if it doesn't work, just throw him away. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was just going to say, from the player's perspective himself, I mean, it looks like he did have a bit of a choice, actually, between mm. these teams. And he's picked Tottenham. Do you think the Mourinho factor was one of the reasons uh, from when we've spoken about Mourinho's perspective? But what about Fernandez himself in terms of going to play at Tottenham? Well, yeah, well, this is a key as well. It's option not obligation to buy as well. Tottenham don't have to sign him. There's a little bit of difficulty at the moment with the Giovanni Lo Celso loan. If Spurs do finish in the top four, they have to sign him, which could be a good thing at the moment because he played very, very well last night and he looks like he's really bedding into Spurs. But they've got 18 months to see him. He'll feel like a Tottenham player and he's also been to the Tottenham match. I think he went to the Chelsea match, although he played not very well that game, but he didn't put him off. It's an amazing stadium. It's a good move for him as well. He's young. But yes, as you rightly say, Jose Mourinho, it's great for Mourinho as well. He needs... Bodies. Bridget, where's, where's Mourinho from again? What country is Mourinho? Oh, well, there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes Portugal. these things just play yeah, off. Absolutely. I think also 18 months is a perfect amount of time because they'll have time to bed in. They'll have time to show Mourinho what he can do, to show the Premier League what he can do. And if at the end of those 18 months it's gone really well and they want to take up that option to buy, then that's great. But if they don't, as I say, he'll have shown everyone what he can do. And if all else fails, he can always go back and start again. Yeah, and he's <laughs> an exciting player for the Premier League in general. Yeah, well, one final thing. So I know we've got to go yeah. on. The three Spurs signings this summer, Lo Celso picked up an injury, didn't hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. Sessegnon came with an injury, yep. didn't hit the ground running. And Don Bele injured. Yeah. Spurs would love to see someone now hit the ground running. And now uh, it's a shame because there is a little bit of pressure. We won't expect too much early doors, the Spurs supporters. Yes, you will. However, <laughs> however that, that would be a real boost for Spurs. And it'd be good for players in the... It gives you a boost, your yeah, player coming in. He's going to play. That's the yeah. most important. That's the yeah, he's going to get game time. He's going to yeah. play he's from, get from day yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to a player that you mentioned there, Michael, in Christian Eriksen, expecting him to leave. He did play 90 minutes in Spurs win over Middlesbrough last night. Talks underway with Inter <coughs> Milan. Actually, let's have a listen to exactly what Jose Mourinho had to say about the midfielder. This was after last night's match. Played very well, very professional, played very well, which is what I expect from, from him. And uh, if his decision is, uh, is to leave, I think he has to leave with his head up, if he gives everything, which is what he tries to do for the, um, for the team. Fans are always to respect, and uh, we have to respect, but I think the boy did it for us today. Yeah, so Mourinho praising Ericsson's professionalism. Michael, just bring us up to speed with exactly... <laughs> <laughs> stop smirking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where uh, Tottenham are with this potential move. Yeah, look, talks are underway between the two clubs. Um, Sky and Italy reporting that Ericsson wants to join into Milan uh, and agree in personal terms. That's not expected to be a problem, the personal terms. The problem at the moment is the valuation of the player. Sky and Italy say Inter have offered €10 million Euros Spurs naturally wanting double that. You'd imagine that wouldn't be a massive problem if it's if it's that small at the moment. What do you reckon? Oh, I, I, I completely agree. I think you just we've seen with the Giroud deal, which is we expect to get done as well. Inter are going to start at a low price and then eventually negotiate, you know, a fee somewhere in the middle, and the deal will get done. For me, I just think the Christian Eriksen situation is absolutely fascinating because we've been talking about it for the last few days, haven't we? And throughout, one, of the, one recurrent theme has been, oh, but big clubs can, bigger clubs can talk to him. The PSGs, the, the Real Madrid's, Barcelona's, they could have talked to him from January 1st. Yeah. But they haven't. The they haven't. The question is, though, why? Because this is Christian Eriksen, and I know that his form has maybe dropped off a little bit in recent times, but he is still... I think, a great player and would be a great attribute to any club. To me, the £10 million is actually very low for a player of his calibre. Yeah, but, I mean, look, as we went through, we went through on Monday, all, all, all of the stats, all his metrics, and so many of them dropped by 20% in a season. You know, you're talking about not just you know, the number of passes, the distance covered, the number of shots, most of his defensive stats too. 20% for a player who's supposed to be in his peak is a heck of a drop-off in, in just 12 yeah, months. And which, also which, which, at, which, which leads those to clubs will also look at it and think to themselves, well, why would I pay 20 million now and I can pay nothing in the summer? I fancy my chances. Yeah. Right. As, as a big club across Europe, the money that and the contracts that I can offer, why would I pay, why would I pay that sort of money or that sort of valuation which Spurs obviously value him at 
when I can get in for free in the summer. But fans are so frustrated as well. We had um, Oozings, didn't we, on um, last week, and he was saying he'd take a packet of peanuts for him. He was like, I just want him out of the club. If he's going to stay here and he's not showing the determination and the passion that he showed last season and the seasons before, then you know, we will replace him anyway. We don't, we don't want a player who's if, not showing that. If the move does materialise, though, I just... Christian Eriksen will get back up to the levels yes. where he, yeah. where exactly. you expect him to be. I mean, sometimes you just have to look at it from a player's perspective. I know sometimes when we focus on clubs so much, we sometimes don't look at the player's angle of it. And the player's angle is, well, he's got six months left on his mm. deal. And if he doesn't see his long-term future there, he's also got to think about injuries. He's got to mm. think about his actual value himself. And he's, those sort of things, I'm just saying, they yeah, just yeah. do play a factor sometimes. I think you're right. But you look at, you know, as our played as, yeah. we knew he wanted to go to Real Madrid for two years. The last very, two years at Chelsea were fantastic. I think Ronaldo's last year though. at Manchester. United. I think it's very absolutely different. fantastic. No, I, I just dip, obviously players. Because okay. Hazard also had a very close affiliation with the Chelsea fans and the club overall as a whole, and and credited and Chelsea for the player that he became. Well, the, fan, I mean, the fans look, were the, cheering him yesterday when his, when his name. That's the problem. There's becoming a disconnect. It, so he's allowed that to get to that situation, it, it, and that's, it, that's that's the problem. That's that's yeah. why they, the fan, the fans see him as culpable for this. It, it feels and a shame. In fact, yeah. so to you to use a, a you know a phrase by Vincent Kennedy McMahon, Ericsson screwed Ericsson. <laughs> <laughs> this guy quotes oh, yeah. WWE. Because, That's on BT because now, you know. We can't do that because anymore. Because effectively, <laughs> look, you know, a club, a club like you know, like Paris Saint Germain, like Barcelona, they're not going to spend 200k a week on a player whose 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 metrics are in decline effectively mm -hmm. until he re regains his form. So he's either got a few months to do that, or he joins into Milan yeah, and shows he's, all he's, the he's, 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 he's the expressions. I, I, I do wonder from Christian's point of view that he expected maybe a Real or a Barca yeah. to have come in, mm -hmm. and it didn't materialise. Um, Inter is a new challenge for him, absolutely. Yeah. But was it the one he was thinking about when originally he told people, I need to move yeah. on? It's amazing, though. Ericsson is one of Tottenham's longest-serving players. Yeah. He was one of the signings. When Gareth Bale left yeah. for Real Madrid, he was one of the, the new signings, and most of them weren't a success at all. Vlad Kirikes, Nasser Chadli, you that name six it. Six-year deal. Joined. That six-year deal. Six six yeah, and, deal and then like, Ericsson wow. joined. He's been a massive success. The, the worry for me is... Go on. <laughs> it, it's starting to get a little bit stale because he has had some excellent yeah. years at Tottenham Hotspur. Mm. That's where I feel if they can agree a fee, it needs to happen. But Spurs do need a, a creative midfielder in there because eventually they will miss that. It's so interesting how one game of football could change everything. If no, you had won yeah. that Champions League game, and I, it just it literally would have changed the whole cycle. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Sorry, Bridget, I didn't mean to do that to you on my first day back, man. Sorry. <laughs> something else I wanted to pick up on, though. I mean, I was going to ask you whether this is just the best thing for everyone, the club, the fans, for Ericsson himself. But, I mean, is there a sense the fans are at the point where they're like, do you know what, Ericsson? Just go, we want rid of you. He's going to move and he's actually going to become, like you mentioned, back to his best again. And they're all going to be like, should have kept him. Why don't we keep if, if Inter Milan can get this deal done in January, mm -hmm. it A, stops anyone else coming in, in in the summer. And they've got a very, very good player for a pretty nominal fee. Yeah, we... And for Inter, I think it's a pretty much a no-brainer, whereas Spurs fans just think, I just want it done now. Yeah, and he has and, also had yeah. some really good displays this season. I know you say his stats have gone down, but in the Champions League against Olympiacos, when he came on after 29 minutes, Jose Mourinho took off Eric Dyer. They were 2-0 down. They went on to win that match 4-2, and that was pretty much a turnaround because he came onto the pitch. So it would be a shame if it ended on a bad note, really, with knowing yeah. that fans are jeering, because he's done so much for the club. And I think they will look back yeah. on oh, it yeah. fondly in hindsight. But just interesting, we were talking about what clubs perhaps should have been in for him and a couple of people already getting in touch using that hashtag transfer talk saying surely United should have been going after Ericsson more should have been chasing and that was Stephen uh, and then Martial I guess a United fan here again saying why aren't United uh, chasing Ericsson uh, yeah who knows uh, just to pick up as well on that breaking news Jensen Fernandez uh, has signed that 18 month loan deal and just a quote to bring you uh, from Fernandez he says it is one big dream to come to this big club so that is what he's said about joining Tottenham uh, right that is the state of play there let's find out what else is going on with the rest of the state of play and Anton Chelsea are unlikely to exercise the £40 million buyback option they have for Bournemouth defender Nathan Ake. Chelsea have also been watching Callum Wilson for the past 12 months, but are unlikely to sign him. Well, Atletico Madrid executives are meeting with Paris Saint-Germain over the transfer of striker Edison Cavani. Atletico, though, are also considering a move for Alexander Lacazette if they cannot do a deal with the French champions.
Watford have signed Argentinian winger Ignatian Pesetta on a four and a half year deal from Udinese. While Everton director of football Marcel Brands has confirmed the club are working on deals for Umar Nias and Cuca Martina to leave this window. And Nuno Espirito Santo remains confident Wolves will land his transfer targets to boost their thin squad, with the club wanting a defender and a striker in the January window. Right, still plenty on the way on Good Morning Transfers. We'll have transfer news from the EFL and will Nathan Ake return to Chelsea this month? Details coming next. Transfer Talk podcast is coming to you live from the Shaw Theatre in London on Sunday, February the 2nd. Join me, Joe Wilson, and Darmesh Sheth as well as our expert panel as we assess the big deals from another frenetic January transfer window. And that's not all, Darmesh, is it? No, certainly not, Joe. We'll be joined by this man. Yes, the former Chelsea, Barcelona and Tottenham striker Ida Johnson. He'll give us his views on the transfer window before delving into his own career to reveal on all the moves that did and didn't happen, as well as providing an insight into how Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola inspired some of their greatest teams. Should be a good one. Yeah, it really should. Make sure you don't miss out. Visit the Sky VIP website to apply for your chance to join us. Yeah, really looking forward to taking Transfer Talk Live with Darmesh. Uh, let's just bring you a little bit more on Tottenham's new signing, Jensen Fernandez. Uh, he has confirmed that 18-month loan deal with an option to buy. And you can head on over uh, to our Sky Sports News blog for all the latest transfer news, uh, as well as the Tottenham Hotspur website, who's got all the details on their new loan signing. And let's just bring you a few quotes. There he is, uh, a picture of him holding up his Tottenham shirt. He says, I'm very happy today. I've made my dream for me. It is a big dream to play for a big club. I will try to give my best for the club every day, every training session, every game for this shirt and every day I'll try to be the best. He goes on to say every player in the world wants to play in the Premier League. It has been a big motivation for me to play in this league. It's made my dream come true. This is a fantastic challenge and I have to win my challenge. So yeah, fair to say that he is pretty excited about getting started and uh, he of course is from Benfica. He says Cristiano Ronaldo, of course, a fellow Portugal player, is his inspiration. Not a bad person to aspire to be like, I would say. Um, let's move on. We're going to get the latest from Chelsea now. They're unlikely to exercise that £40 million buyback option they have for Bournemouth defender Nathan Ake. Anton, can you see why Chelsea have made this decision and, and want to look elsewhere? Uh, yes, I don't think they're looking elsewhere at centre-backs, I think they're looking elsewhere further forward. But I can see why, because Frank Lampard assessed the centre-back situation in the summer, didn't he? And he, he realised Fakaya Tomori fits in perfectly after his loan spell at Derby into what he's trying to build at Chelsea. So it's four centre-backs with Christensen and Zuma being there as well and Rudiger being first choice. He had his, he's got his four centre-backs he wants to build for the next couple of years around. Uh, and maybe Nathan Aki would destabilise things if he brought him in. There is an argument to say, from a purely commercial point of view, if Chelsea bought him for £40 million, they're not going to lose any money if they sort of, you know, keep him and try to develop him and then move him on later. Uh, I know Mark McAdam on this, on this programme is, is a big fan of him and says he can play... He say, well, he said on this programme previously he could play for Barcelona, um, which is high praise indeed, isn't it? <laughs> but um, I can completely understand Chelsea's decision. I think it's backing what the manager's trying to do, which is a really, really healthy sign, considering sometimes the transfer policy and the manager's wishes haven't been hand-in-hand -hand at Chelsea in the past. I remember when Harry Maguire obviously left Leicester and at the time they were being linked with potentially looking at Nathan Ake and at the time Bournemouth was saying, you know, he'd be going for 80, 90 million pounds. So for me, I can't believe that Chelsea aren't wanting to exercise this option. It's crazy, but it's obviously what they want to do. And Frank Lampard has talked about not being too re... What's the word? Reactionary. Yeah. That's how you say it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, they know that they can sign players, but they're not just going to go out and get anyone, only players that they want to make the team better. And you get the feeling that that's why Lampard's not taken this decision. It's interesting as well, isn't it? Because from Ake's point of view, I mean, it's not a bad move. He's no, you know, kind of grew up through the system at Chelsea. Very much so. Interesting to see whether he would have fancied his chances at breaking into that Chelsea yeah. team. You know, he's been mooted for a big move for quite a while. It hasn't happened. Bournemouth's form's kind of fallen off a cliff. They're in the relegation places. Um, could end up in the championship next season then. Well, wait, which means he could be bought for less than 40 Yeah, his value would actually go the other way. Nathan yeah. Ake won't play in the championship, let's right. be real. Nah. We've seen the quality that he has. You've seen that he can demonstrate at both domestic level and international level. He won't end up in the championship. 
I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't exercise this rule just purely because of the value for the player. That's the only real question mark. Chelsea are the only club that could probably, across the whole of Europe, get a player like Nathan Ake for £40 million. So you would think to yourself, when that simple equation, it would weigh up and you would just purchase the player. But I can understand the dynamic of the squad because he is a big, big fan of Tamori, especially working with him at Derby and then progressing him into the first team at Chelsea. It would as you say, unsettle that balance. But Ake does fit that mould at the same time of developing young players and, and having them come through your youth system. And his stats aren't bad either. Uh, I mean, we can have a look at them. I think it's games played 103. Here we go. Dual success rate 59%, tackle success rate 61%, 111 interceptions, 75 blocks and a passing accuracy of 86%. And you do get that feeling that he could really develop if he did go back to Chelsea just under their philosophy at the moment with Lampard and Jody Morris. Well, well, he's also playing with Virgil van Dijk for a very successful Netherlands side with Ronald mm. Koeman. That's what would attract me as well. Now, other clubs have looked at Nathan Ake, and a strength I like of Nathan Ake, we're, we're short in the Premier League of really good left-sided yep. centre-halves. So that's why I'm slightly surprised on the Chelsea perspective. However, Frank Lampard might be saying to Jody Morris, look, as JD said, this is a settled squad. We're doing probably better than some expected, which is fair. They're in the top four, doing very well in the Cups in, in Europe. But I'm happy with what we've got yeah. at the back. And we've got targets for the summer. And we don't want to be big spending January Chelsea all of a sudden. That's the only way I can see it, because I like Aki, I like what he does. And I think they're decent stats for, for a club he's playing for who aren't doing very well at the moment. We're just going to break away from this for a moment. We will get back to Chelsea and one of Aki's Bournemouth teammates, actually. But just a bit of breaking news to bring you. And it is that the former England international striker, Eni Aluko, has announced her retirement from football. And Anton, you can bring us a little bit more on this. Yeah, Eni Aluko, who um, spent the last season at Juventus, kind of after leaving Chelsea, spent two spells at Chelsea. Uh, more than 100 caps for England. I think yeah. people forget about Eni Aluko. She's been in and around that England team for, what, 10, 12 years, I mean, a real, real stalwart and averages one in three goals for England. That's not bad at all, 33, 33 goals uh, for England. So one of England's sort of better all-time strikers, to be brutally honest, sort of calling it a day. Uh, oh, look, her time with England in the last few years will be remembered for what happened sort of Mark off the Sampson. field with Mark Sampson. But that does not take away how good a player Annie Luca was. She was fantastic for Chelsea, averaging a goal about every other game. Uh, she won Serie A with Juventus in her first season. She went to the States as well. She did well out there. So a real kind of, you know, just a, a bright little forward that could just have the pace and just have the nous to get about the pitch. And, and has been, you know, one of the players that has helped grow the game. One of the first people you think of when you think about women's football in the UK is Eni Aluko. She's an exceptionally eloquent spokesperson for the game as well as being one heck of a player. So she's going to be missed on the field. Uh, I think she could definitely still do a job in the WSL, but she's clearly, uh, clearly decided to go elsewhere and I cannot blame her for that at all because she's given so much. Yeah, I, just, and I also just think, it's just on a complete side point, because I've, I've spoken to her a couple of times in the last six months or so and the impact that she's had on football overall as a whole, we won't be able to maybe appreciate yeah. until she retires and we maybe look back on some of our staple points, but just the impact that she's had in terms of standing up for things that are right in football, I think she just will definitely get recognised yeah. later on in her life, but um, those that really understand the game will appreciate her now. Her impact on the culture Facts. within within football clubs will have a greater effect than just the England setup or the women's game. 100%. It's, it's the game as a whole, especially the game in the UK. So, yeah, I completely agree with JD. She, deserves a lot of lot of respect for what she's done there but also on the field as well don't forget she's one heck of a player yeah mm -hmm. and she says my dear friend football it's time to hang up my boots and retire thank you football for everything you've given and taught me thanks for the full circle moments and crazy unexpected journey and um, we are going to get back to Chelsea now because I mentioned that they were talking about one of Nathan Aki's teammates. We know that Chelsea have been watching Callum Wilson uh, for the past 12 months, but we now also know that they're unlikely to make a move for him. Uh, JD, I mean, we've been talking about form yeah. and recent form and the effect it can have. Do you think this is purely down to Wilson's recent form? Um, I think it's down to two things. I, I, me, I don't really like to... Uh, form is an, a good thing. Like, it is a good thing to focus on, but I do think also, especially with strikers, you cannot really take it you have to take it as a pinch of salt sometimes because and, and I see Anton ready to go at me but just just go with me <laughs> for a second uh, Callum Wilson is a proven striker in this league like in terms of 14 goals last year eight goals the season before he's proven that he can score within the Premier League at the highest level we've seen the reports over the last 12 months or so that link with Chelsea we've seen him also sign a long-term contract with Bournemouth as well so those sort of sort of factors would deter Chelsea's interest away from let's say an, a move for Callum Wilson to Chelsea but at the same time 
I think it's difficult to judge a striker that's struggling in a team at this moment in time that isn't playing very well. He hasn't I mean, scored since September. I understand that, and I'm going to take that into consideration. But they also haven't won... They've only won two games in September, and he's only featuring in one of those games. So at the same time, it's good to focus on Callum Wilson and say you haven't scored any goals or this hasn't happened. But at the same time, your team overall hasn't produced. Yeah, but Ch Chelsea aren't after a reclamation project. But they, I'm just, they, they can't afford to take a chance yeah. on someone reason, that isn't in form. They want to make the top four. And they need someone that's going to come the in and The reason I was going to turn around and focus goals. on form was because I've noticed that throughout Callum Wilson's whole history in terms of in the Premier League, when he scores one, he scores in bunches. And I asked anybody that's played Fantasy League this year, when you put Callum Wilson when he scores one, he scores in a routine. So I think <laughs> with strikers, yeah, he, does. he just needs confidence to get going. And once he gets one goal, I just honestly feel like it's a snowball effect, especially with certain strikers. Yeah. And he's definitely one of those strikers. I mean, you said he hasn't scored since September. He actually hasn't had a shot on target in the Premier League uh, since October. That was that against Arsenal. And <laughs> these are his stats. It's 35 games played, 12 goals, four assists. This is uh, from January 2019. 233 minutes per goal, 26 shots on target, a conversion rate of 20.7%. I mean, it's just not good enough. Is that, is it? Well, averaging less than a shot a game, quite substantially less than a shot a game, is. is you're right. I mean, yes, okay, fine. It's Bournemouth aren't in great form, but they need someone like Callum Wilson to step up, to be in the right place at the right time. You know, they've got Ryan Fraser who's coming back into the form. They've got Harry Wilson. It's not so they don't have much creativity in the team. They, they do have some there. Yeah, you know, they need everybody to step up at Bournemouth, but they you, especially need their senior players. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, this is good news for Eddie Howe, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the best news Eddie Howe can oh, have yeah. this yeah. January, keeping those players. Um, we understand that Howe has the full support of everyone at the club, but they're away to Norwich on Saturday. That is a massive match for both clubs. Okay. Yeah, no, it is indeed. Uh, let us know what you think. Use that hashtag transfer talk. Have your say. Uh, Alexander Lacazette, he's been linked with a move to Spain. We'll discuss that next. And are Aston Villa any closer to finding a striker? Stay with us. Welcome back to Good Morning Transfers. Now time for a look at some of the latest transfer lines from across the EFL. Now Huddersfield are in talks with Leicester over a loan deal for Andy King. The midfielder's loan spell at Rangers was cut short back in September. That was because of a lack of game time under Steven Gerrard. Leicester City's Philip Benkovic is Derby County's number one target as they look to bring in an experienced centre-back in this window. And forward Rafa Mer's loan spell at Nottingham Forest has ended. He's now returned to Wolves. Preston defender Josh Earl has joined League One promotion chasers Ipswich. That's on loan for the rest of the season. Connor Gallagher, he's been recalled from his loan spell at Charlton by Chelsea. Burton have signed midfielder Joe Powell from West Ham on a two and a half year deal. And Newport have signed Barnsley winger Jordan Green on loan for the rest of the season. Alice, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to now turn our attention to a European transfer that could potentially impact the future of Arsenal forward Alexander Lacazette. Atletico Madrid executives are meeting with Paris Saint-Germain over the transfer of their striker Edison Cavani. If they can't get a deal done for Cavani though, Atletico are considering a move for Lacazette. Stay with me here, they're not the only mm -hmm. players involved as that could also involve a potential swap with Thomas Lamar. And we did tease this uh, just before the break, already playing of you getting in touch. Hashtag transfer talk. Remember, Jake says we can't let Lacazette go, especially with Obama Young being suspended. We need those two strikers. They've been pivotal for us this season. And if we lose him, there will be a massive hole in the squad. JD, do you agree? Can you see Arsenal wanting to let Lacazette I go? I just think that, just, just, just ask yourself that question. Why would Arsenal let go of Alexander Lacazette? They're trying to rebuild the team in terms of and focus it around those centre points. So you're talking about Alexander Lacazette, you're talking about Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, to Mesut Ozil. I don't understand why you would let one of your best players leave in this window, especially when you've just had a new manager come in and you're trying to revamp all of those ideas. It would make no sense. It would be one step backwards for 15 steps. Like it would be one step forward for 15 steps backwards. <laughs> I mean, just think about his impact on the field first of all. Like he scores the, the most important goals in terms of I think about the goal against Atletico. Madrid last year, Liverpool against Spurs, he pops up in the most important times. People will look at the statistics and it won't jump out to you because he's only scored five goals. But anybody that watches Lacazette understands that the, he is the pinpoint that Arsenal springboard a lot of their attacks off. 
He is the target man that links up Aubameyang, links in with Pepe, links in with Ozil and allows those players to flourish in that system. And then off the field, I just, like his leadership and his dedication has just been proven, even during the times when it was bad under Emery. And Lamar coming in would be a bit of a risk as well because, yeah, like that Monaco side was an absolute joy to watch. But I think we've got some stats here as well. If we look at Lamar for Atletico Madrid, um, his record in all competitions, he's played 64 games, uh, four goals, six assists. It's shots on target 20, conversion rate 7.8%. Now, we know he's a top player, but we've seen it at Monaco, but that suggests that it's not gone yeah. well at all. If you hadn't seen him, it, yeah, please. Yeah, it's not gone well at all in that. Spain, has it? Yeah. And as I say, JD, I mean, he's a key player, like I said, for Arsenal. Uh, in the mould, playing with Arteta and sort of a bit deeper this time around, it looks like a non-starter to me. Yeah, and I mean, Arsenal, JD, you were saying, why would they let him go? But from Lacazette's perspective, mm -hmm. is there any way you could see that he would want to go and he would actually be a good fit at Atletico? Or would he be a good fit at Atletico? Yes, I'm not trying to put, uh, push Alexander Lacazette out the door, <laughs> but most players would be a good fit in the Atletico system. I mean, you're talking about he would be playing in Europe's elite competition. He'd be playing in a more competitive sort of overall team that has a, a, probably a better sense of direction at this moment in time. But at the same time, you can see what this club sort of Arsenal means to him. So he wants to be ingrained in that project. And you've seen that with his dedication, you've seen that with his attitude. He was especially upset towards the end of that Emery era. That's not a player that seems to be one foot outside of the door. That seems to be someone that kind of moves in the right direction. And I don't need to hark on social media, but that close relationship that he has with Pei Emerick Aubameyang as well, that's a genuine friendship. It, yeah. looks it like. says a lot, doesn't it, that you know, Arteta's finally found a way to play them both. And it's Aubameyang who's pretty much gone, well, out, not out of position, he can play more on the mm -hmm. left, but that's what he's moved so they can get the most out of Lacazette. I think that says it all, really. I think Arsenal have got a big decision to make either now or in the summer, though, simply because Lacazette has two years left in his contract from the summer onwards. But Aubameyang... And that's, that's the danger time, isn't it? That's when you re renegotiate. That's when you try to get him yeah. to commit. And money talks as well. So it, it depends how much Atletico want a player, how much they would yeah. be prepared to spend. Yeah, I think how much they spent on Morata, and that hasn't quite worked out. Diego Costa hasn't quite worked out. They're Felix. still trying to find that <laughs> number nine. Playing for Simeone is a big draw. Mm. Playing in the Champions League, playing in that fantastic stadium, uh, the one of Metropolitano is, is, is a big draw as well. So I don't, it's easy to discount Atletico sometimes because they're the third club in Spain. They're one of the best clubs in Europe. But and Yang, they're in the Champions League. He, he recently came out, didn't he, in his notes in the programme and said that he would like to stay at Arsenal and his future is very much with them. He's yet to sign a new deal, but you talk, JD, about the partnership the pair have got there and how well they play together. Yes, he might only have scored five goals is it, in the league this season, but it's what he does outside of goal scoring as 100%. well. And that partnership is there. So it seems like a good place to be with Arteta at the minute. Yeah, absolutely. A few people getting in touch. Harry says it would be a massive step backwards if Arsenal sell Lacazette, especially if they don't have a replacement. Pretty much exactly what you were saying, JD. He says Lamar is good, but not worthy of the Premier League. Uh, although Abu Bakr is saying, yeah, swap Lacazette with Lamar plus a bit of cash. Wow. Get in touch. Use that hashtag transfer talk and stay with us here on Good Morning Transfers. Don't forget, you can download the latest episode of the Transfer Talk podcast as well. It's available right now on iTunes and Spreaker. Uh, but next up, we've got news from the Scottish Premiership, Barcelona, as well as Manchester United. Come over here. Here we go. Scottish Premiership Roundup. We have a Scottish Premiership Roundup for you every day. Let's start with Celtic and manager Neil Lennon. Wanted a striker and he's got one. They have signed Patrick Kamala for 3 point four million pounds. The Celtic are also still interested in Stokes, Tyrese Campbell, as are Rangers. Yes, Jermaine Defoe telling us last night. He wasn't aware of that, but we weren't too sure if Jermaine was just keeping his cards close to his chest. Now, Steven Gerrard, he still has to trim his squad with Greg Doherty, could be going back out on loan, and also Jamie Murphy could also leave on loan to get some minutes under his belt after missing the vast majority of the season with a knee injury he suffered at Kilmarnock. Now, Roma are looking at former Barisic. What a season he's having. And Rangers made it clear that he is not going anywhere. Let's go on to Hearts. Need players, need points. And their manager, Daniel Stendhal, has been busy. Glenn Whelan has already been released, while club captain Christoph Berra has been told to train with the youth team. Now, the return of Stephen Naismith and John Suter from injury will feel like new signings, but Stendhal says the club are very close to bringing players in and hopes to be able to say more in the next few days.
Michael, thank you for that. We're going to go from Edinburgh uh, to Barcelona now. Not much difference there. Um, <laughs> make sure you download the latest episode of the Transfer Talk podcast, by the way, because our Spanish football expert, Graham Hunter, uh, had a good chat with him about all things Barcelona and what's going on there. A new man, of course, in charge, in Kike Setien. Uh, and Anton, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but we've got to talk about Luis Suarez and that long-term injury. Do you think that could put Barcelona now in the market for a striker? It could. Or it could mean Antoine Griezmann plays in a more natural role and actually plays through the middle and could actually reinvigorate his spell at, at Barcelona. Barcelona haven't intended to go into the, to the market in January, as just neither have our Real Madrid. It's kind of um, sticking with what they've got and developing what they've got. They've let Carlos and Lina leave. They might leave Arturo Vidal leave as well. So it's more about trimming the squad in preparation for the summer when they'll do some big spending. But, he's, but Suarez has effectively done for the season. And if results don't necessarily... When I say pick up, they're top of the league. But they still yeah. fired their manager. It's a really, situa really weird situation at Barcelona, isn't it, at the moment? Because they've got rid of their manager uh -huh. because they aren't accruing enough points. And their points, season on season, like season three in Valverde, are in decline. So that's effectively why they've made this decision. Plus the Champions League sort of upsets, defeats, they just haven't got over those. So that's why they've made the change. But will it affect... I think Setien has been brought in because he plays a certain style of football that is more Barcelona-esque than than uh, Valverde and I think therefore he'll be given the squad to work with so they'll o only if the results don't go particularly well in the first couple of weeks will you see them make a move for a striker. I think, I think the way that you talk about that sacking I think it is very unique because you don't really hear of managers top of the league getting sacked before but as you say the Barcelona hierarchy have such a high standard for what they expect and it honestly you look back on it because if at first it doesn't make any sense you, you sign a manager to a new contract extension in February last year and you're thinking to yourself this is a long-term project like you're happy with the way that he's been building you talked about that 90 point season that he had as well and you would think that it's going in the right sort of direction but there's significant moments that they will remember and they clearly haven't got over and that overturn in terms of in the Champions League which we always think about Trent getting the last minute assist for Dedrick Origi but like there was losing a three goal lead regardless if you're away and Barcelona is just a no-go and, and then you think about it on top of that you think about the Valencia loss as well in the Copa del Rey and then as we were just talking about offset as well that that loss in the Spanish Super mm. Cup yeah. to Atleti it, it just builds up and then all of those factors added together, there's significant moments yeah. in the Barcelona hierarchy. It was, it was minds. the manner of that defeat. They were leading 2 1 with nine minutes to play, and they end up going and losing 3 2. And the way that the fans obviously react to that, I think it just goes to show the pressure of managing a club like Barcelona. It's, it's going to come. You know, he secured back to back La Liga titles. As you say, he went on and, and signed that new deal, and still they've made this decision, but that's how it is, I but guess. You've, you've seen that with their signings. So you've seen Usman Dembele struggle. You know, to, to reach that level. Mm -hmm. You've seen Griezmann effectively struggle to reach that level. And they're hoping a new manager will come in and unlock the potential of the players they've already bought so they don't have to go in and reinvigorate the squad again. Yeah, because we talk about surprise transfers in terms of players, but a bit of a surprise transfer in terms of uh, the new manager there at Barcelona. It'll be interesting to see what they happen. Right, let's check in with the state of play and Anton. Yeah, here's what else, what else is going on uh, around the league. And Jetson Fernandez has joined Tottenham on an 18-month loan from Benfica. Now, the deal comes with an option to buy for around 50 million euros. That's 42.7 million pounds. Christian Eriksen's move away from Tottenham seems to be edging closer. Our colleagues in Italy are reporting that Spurs are in talks with Inter Milan over a permanent move, but a fee is a long way from being agreed. Chelsea are, un are unlikely to exercise a £40 million buyback option they have for Bournemouth defender Nathan Ake. Everton director of football Marcel Brands has confirmed the club is working on deals for Umar Nias and Kuka Martino to leave the club this transfer window. And Nuno Espirito Santo remains confident Wolves will land his transfer targets to boost their thin squad with the club wanting a defender and especially a striker in this January transfer window. Right, we've confirmed the signing of one Fernandez, that loan move uh, to Tottenham. But lots of people, Manchester United fans, crying out to hear uh, about the signing of another Fernandez, Bruno Fernandez. Uh, we understand Manchester United still in talks with Sporting over Fernandez, but the clubs are still a long way apart in terms of valuation. Uh, Michael, some reports coming out of Portugal on this overnight. Well, this is the Fernandez I thought was going to probably end up at Tottenham, especially <laughs> last summer. But it's, it's too confusing. It's, yeah, it's, it's Jesse Fernandez who's joined Tottenham. And our colleague Dama Chef was a across that all throughout this this month but yes let's go on to Bruno Fernandes um, a, a, a Gonzalo Lopez uh, on Twitter Portuguese journalist very very well respected he said it's it's close um, but what could be halting the deal is that Fernandes plays for sporting against Benfica on Friday 
and then after that, then the deal gets done. Obviously, if he plays in that match, he won't be able to play against Liverpool the live on Super Sunday. So if that's the only thing holding the deal up, I'd imagine Man United fans obviously don't want to lose to Liverpool, but if that's the only few sticking points, you'd imagine they'd take it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've been here before with Bruno Fernandes. We've been speaking about it lots during this window. We're only, what, into the second week. We spoke about it loads in the summer. It didn't happen. And you can kind of sense the frustration from United fans getting in touch, just simply asking Bruno Fernandes, question mark, question mark, question mark, because they're desperate for an update. Is there a, a fear? Is there a risk? This actually just isn't going to happen. We're going to talk about it lots. I don't... Yes. Because this has got... All right, fair enough, they signed Harry Maguire, but this is deja vu, where we knew who their target was, and yet a club like Manchester United was quibbling over a few million pounds, and it was still going on and still going on. The problem is now, if United, you know, don't get them in the team sooner rather than later, it could affect their chances of getting in maybe Champions League, maybe even Europa League. That could cost them the few million pounds they've been quibbling over. So, you know, it makes economic sense to get this deal done. You're Manchester United, you've got the money. The clubs know you've got the money. We know Sporting's asking prices. Well, they've been very, very open about this. So it's one of those situations where if he is their, if he is their top target this window, there's no real reason why this deal shouldn't get but done. Sporting right now. need the money as well. We know how, the financial difficulties they're in, so it would be a good deal, really, for them to do as well. And we know the player wants to come to England. It would. We've been talking about it potentially being a bit of a U-turn because they were obviously interested and then they weren't. But we know how much they need that creative midfielder coming in. And what is the future of Pogba? That remains to be seen. But he's obviously injured a lot at the minute. Scott McTominay is injured as well. So. So they're crying out for this kind of player and I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a U-turn. You know, situations change. You can't obviously know what's going to happen with injuries as well. So it's an exciting one for Manchester United fans. Yeah, they're playing Wolves tonight, of course, and Anton, they've been linked with the Wolves player. Uh, any updates at all? Yeah, they've been linked with Raul Jimenez, haven't they? But no, no bid has gone into Wolves and it would have to be an exceptionally high one for Wolves to budge in general, but especially now considering he's pretty much their only out-and-out -out striker in that squad as well. So Wolves', Wolves uh, January planning isn't exactly going according to plan, I think it's fair to say, because they have targets and they aren't in the building at the moment, which Nuno wanted them in from week one and they haven't arrived. It's not to say they won't, but at the moment they haven't. So Raul Jimenez is integral to what, to what Wolves do and what Wolves are trying to achieve. I think it's going to cost Lukaku money to get him in, which again leads to questions about the you know, transfer policy at Manchester United when they had a player that they sold for 75 million who's now scoring goals in Europe uh, into Milan. So it's fascinating. But at the moment, there's absolutely no change in the fact that there, nothing has happened between Manchester United and Wolves or Raul Jimenez. Well, United and Wolves play each other tonight in the FA Cup replay. This is two sides. You could have probably done without it. <laughs> Although they both want to obviously win the cup. But they've got the Europa League to come and United want to try and get in the top four. It's funny though, going back to Bruno Fernandes, we talk about experience, he's only 25. Yeah. yeah. You know, but United, uh, the fans need it. It would be such a boost for them to get him. I, I'd like to see him go elsewhere, but I can't see it happening. But I think it'd be a, it'd be a massive, massive. You want two Fernandes? Two Fernandes. Yeah, yeah. I, I want you to see him in Tottenham. Greedy. <laughs> <It's really? laughs> yeah, talking about Palace, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's just remind you of that news that we brought you regarding Jetson Fernandes. Tottenham have confirmed that 18 month loan deal. It is an option to buy as well. Uh, and it's fair to say he sounds pretty excited about joining. Uh, we do have some quotes on the Tottenham website from Fernandes himself, uh, where he says, I'm very happy to be here today to make my dream a reality. For me, it is one big dream to come to this big club. I will try to give my best for the club every single day, in every training session and in every game. And I will try to help the team wherever I can, working hard every day for this shirt. Uh, he talks about the stadium, says it's unbelievable. He's never seen anything like this and that he is just excited to get started. Uh, lots of you have been getting in touch today using that hashtag transfer talk. Just wanted to pick up quickly on the Arsenal talk. Uh, Matthew, he says if we can get a swap deal for Lamar, it will prove more useful than keeping hold of Lacazette because Obama Yang will represent the number nine position, pushing Lamar out on either the right or left wing with backups from the youth. Uh, but Scott says Lacazette's a phenomenal player. Goal stats don't tell the whole story. Combined with Obama Yang, these two are two true team players and could become legendary. Uh, but that is it for Good Morning Transfers. It's been a nice busy show. Thank you very much, JD, Alice, uh, Michael and Anton. Remember, you can download that podcast. It's available on iTunes, Speaker, Sky Sports website. Good Morning Transfers is back tomorrow at 9 o'clock and Transfer Talk returns in a couple of hours. That is from midday. We will have a very special guest, a pop star, mm -hmm. joining us in the studio. <laughs>
<laughs> and the transfer show that returns tonight. Darmish and Cavi back at 7 o'clock. Next up on Sky Sports News, Dean Ashton joins Rob Watton.